can call this the new world order. Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. <laughs> with me, Mr. Berger. I'm a professional artist and master educator attempting to provide you the best in art historical content. If you like this one, as always, I'd appreciate you to follow along. Thanks to uh, current subscribers as well. Beep, 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 beep. My bullcrap meter's going crazy. Today, I'm at what was once known as the Black Mountain College right here in Black Mountain, North Carolina. We're going to talk a little bit today about this college and how it would shape and really revolutionize modern art as we know it. So, here we go. Friends, if you've ever stepped in an art classroom, chances are the instruction that you have been provided is in some way rooted to the Black Mountain College in North Carolina. So let us dive into the specifics of that institution. In 1933, John Rice, classics professor at Rollins College in Florida, was fired from his position. And so he, some students and faculty, decided to set up an alternative school outside of Asheville, North Carolina, in a little town called Black Mountain. The concept was simple. Students and the arts would be at the center of the school's activities and identity. The only problem was, Rice didn't know anything about art or any artists to teach it. Philip Johnson, who was the curator of archaeology at the Museum of Modern Art, suggested to him that he needed to hire Joseph Albers. The Nazis had just closed down the Bauhaus. This was Europe's art and design school in Germany, and so Albers was pretty much available. He and his wife Annie, who was a master weaver, both came to provide instruction. And as instructors, they had a pretty straightforward approach. You learn by doing. Joseph Albers very much had a reputation, but his wife, Annie, would really work to translate his classes, typing up the college bulletin, as well as teaching weaving classes. And so her presence there was very influential. Many of the male instructors would bring their wives along with them. Also like William de Kooning. He was brought in as an instructor by invitation, but his wife, Elaine de Kooning, was the one that was giving the, the bulk of the instruction. And these were unpaid positions. They were just kind of there with their husbands and helping do the work, but they were not paid directly for their time or skills. But this was more than just an art school. Without question, this was an experimental liberal arts college, again with art at the center of pedagogy, of pedagogical experiment. And it was interest focused. Curriculum was not forced. This was a progressive school to be sure. And the work was to be done independently. Let me ask you a question. What are you going to do in the world? This was the fundamental question that was asked at the Black Mountain College. At this school, everybody did everything together from eating to working and everything else. There was no hierarchy. At the Black Mountain College, going to class was not required. What was required was self-discipline. There was no competition, and everybody had time and space to do their work, whatever their work happened to be. But one of the requirements of their time at the Black Mountain College was to perform work. And by that I mean, part of the total education was participating in physical work, whether that be in the field doing agricultural work, or perhaps in a kitchen doing custodial work, or even working in the library. Everybody had a job that they needed to do in order to earn their keep. Now, where would this all happen? They ended up finding a spot at the recommendation of somebody who had visited there, and they knew of an old property at this old YMCA camp conference center, and they kind of created the whole idea around this in about six weeks. Although the school was progressive, Joseph Albers was a very stern taskmaster of an instructor. He did not easily give praise, and he believed that the work that students were doing was all about study. That's a good start was about the best compliment you could get from Mr. Joseph Albers. The school was ran democratically. Now, the faculty was in charge of the educational policies, but there was a board of fellows, including staff and a student, that oversaw a lot of the policies. 
Students and staff would do everything from hiring, firing, and accepting new students into the college. A lot of these operational concepts were borrowed from the Quaker religion. Now to unwind, students would often go to Black Mountain and visit Pete's Tavern. And it was a somewhat normal college experience with romance and drinks. And these students were the outcasts of the outcasts. Nobody from town really liked them at all, as a matter of fact. Locals were very suspicious of the college, thinking it was way too liberal and very radical. For example, it would blow their minds that they would allow for racial integration. In 1944, they allowed two black students in the college for admittance. Now, during the end of the Depression, this school was really struggling financially, but they would trudge along. Another of the interesting things about the school structure was there was no exam, really. All students would start in what was called general studies, but then when they would move out of general studies into a more specific track, there would be an examination, but this wasn't like a normal examination. They would do things like write a description of the road leading up to the college, for example. These exams were exercises in self-development. Davis, you gotta get a whiff of this. No <laughs> way, <laughs> They felt that learning was a process, and no one really knew what the results would be. Eventually, the school would acquire some property at Lake Eden, where the property was developed after the lake was somewhat drained. They would build cottages and things like that, and eventually move from Lee Hall, that old YMCA building, to this new property known as the Studies Building, which took about two years to build. Each student was provided with their own private studio space, and sleeping was done in a larger group communal space. They offered some bigger summer projects and programs at the college, and they were also known for their weeks of leisure time, where students were set out to explore their own ways of relaxation and leisure without being confined by the college structure or format. By 1948-49, finances were really, really bad shape, and the college was in desperate need for restructuring. Joseph Albers quit, and these things called for a major break in restructuring of the entire college system. Poet Charles Olson was brought in as the lead. But despite these financial setbacks, there were some very innovative things still happening at the college. For example, in 1952, John Cage would organize the first happening at Black Mountain College. This would be a merger of art and life. Not necessarily a studio space, but a real fusion of art and life together. I want to play a game. What would it mean to teach everyone to think critically? They were not specifically interested in training artists, but instead they were interested in producing citizens. It just so happens that many of them that they trained to be citizens also wanted to become artists. They would try to get Richard Diebenkorn to come in and teach, and there were some conversations and phone calls back and forth, and they were going to call him the next day. But when he ended up calling in to have a discussion about his tenure at the college, he discovered that it was already shut down the night before. There was really no institutional structure to sustain business at the Black Mountain College. There was no real good management. And a lot of the artists that would go into helping build this would splinter off and develop other programs in other colleges and institutions all across the country. Annie Albers would have her solo show at the Museum of Modern Art. Cage and Mercer would have their idea of the happening exploding. De Kooning would go on to New York and form the club on the model of the Black Mountain College. Rauschenberg's combine art would explode and take off. Joseph Albers would go off to become the head of Yale University's art department, and it is very safe to say that most art programs across the country have a root, if not multiple roots, in the Black Mountain College model. So whether you're looking at the model from a high school perspective, from a college perspective, a graduate perspective, the Black Mountain College definitely has had an influence in the way you have been educated and the way artists have been educated for decades. Hey, I love bringing you that story. Thanks for coming along with me. We'll see you again next time. Tell Annie I'm the little yeller out.